Hello! This lesson comes to you in three parts, and these parts align with our learning goals for this topic. After this lesson, you will be able to 1. Compare objects in Java, 2. Write a simple recursive function, and 3. Describe merge sort, including how it uses recursion and its big O efficiency. So let's get into part 1, comparing objects in Java. On the screen here, I have an example of a main method that sorts an array list of strings. I create the array list, add some strings to it, and then call collections.sort on my array list. Collections.sort is part of java.util, and it will take the array and rearrange the elements to be in sorted order. And so this code will print out the unsorted words, that I added to my array list four score and seven years ago, and then we'll print out the sorted words, a go and four score seven years. Now, how did Java know which string should come before another? You may notice that it sorted them in alphabetical order, but it still needed some way of knowing which order that was. And for that, it used the string classes compare to method. And this is, in fact, the method that all objects that can be compared to one another will use to do so. Of course, not all objects in Java can be compared. For example, the coin strip class that you implemented for Lab 1, it wouldn't really make sense to say one coin strip object is less than or greater than another coin strip object, so it wouldn't have a compare to method. But strings, we would want to make these sort of comparisons. An important thing to note is that this compare to method can't just return true or false because there are three possible answers. One string could be less than another, could be greater than another, and could also be equal to another. And so for that reason, our compare to methods return an integer. And in particular, they'll return a negative number, not a particular negative number, but any negative number, to indicate a less than relationship, zero to indicate equality, and a positive number to indicate a greater than relationship. So let's consider this code here. We have three strings, hello, world, and hello again, and I compare x to y with x dot compare to of y. So this is calling the, the compare to method on x, and comparing x to y using that method with x compared to z and y compared to x. And what these print out is negative 15, 0, and 15. It prints out negative 15 because the string x, hello, comes alphabetically before the string y, world. And Java, when it compares strings using compare to, will do so alphabetically. And when x compares to z, these are the same. So that compare to returns 0, and that gets printed out. And then finally, when y compares to x, when we compare a string that is later in the alphabet, uh, that returns a positive number to indicate that it is greater than z. Now, going back to the original example, you'll notice that when we use collections.sort, it put them in ascending alphabetical order, so it started at the beginning of the alphabet and went to the end. And so this is an indication that collections.sort will sort elements in ascending order. So it will put the smallest ones first. And as we see, the string compare to method returns a negative number when, a, when the first string comes alphabetically before the second, and so that causes collections.sort to put them in this ascending alphabetical order. So if you're curious about why these exact numbers are returned, this is nicely described in the documentation uh, for the string compare to method, which is linked from here in the notes. Uh, but what I want to focus on is how compare to is used. And note that we cannot use the normal like angle bracket to do one string less than another, that code will compile. Java only knows how to use that operator with primitive data types and not with objects like strings. Instead, 
we would need to use the compare to string method to say s1 dot compare to of s2 less than zero to test if the string s1 was less than s2. And it's not only strings, as I said, that are compared to this way. Uh, Any time we compare objects, we're going to want to do it using compare to. And this actually comes from an interface that these comparable objects, objects that can be put in an, an order like numbers or strings, um, they all implement the comparable interface, which is a very short interface that just says you have a compare to method that returns an, inter, uh, an integer. And so in the notes, there's this handy table of the relationship that you're trying to test, for example, less than. If you have primitive data such as ints or doubles, you would say x less than y, the way that we're used to. For objects, we would say x dot compare to of y less than zero, where because compare to will return a negative number to indicate a less than relationship, we do less than zero uh, for this. And these other uh, relationships uh, fall along the same lines, less than or equal to becomes x dot compare to y less than or equal to zero, equality compared to will return zero, not equal compared to will return something other than zero, whether, whether less than or greater than, and greater than is greater than zero or greater than equal to zero. And so just like uh, when we've been comparing uh, values in, in the linked list uh, lab, we had to use dot equals instead of uh, double equals to compare values in our nodes. Uh, the comparing, o comparing objects in Java uses uh, the compare to method instead of the direct comparison operators we can use with primitive types. So let's go through an example of how we would make our own class comparable, how we would make uh, Java able to sort it, how we would make it able to use the compare to method to uh, compare to objects of that class. And for this, we'll talk about a class that implements a calendar date. And for this, we're just going to keep track of a month and a day. For example, uh, the United States will celebrate Labor Day on September 6th this year, or an organization might want a list of its employees' birthdays that doesn't have the, their birth year and so doesn't indicate how old they are. So we're going to say public class calendar date. We're going to have two private fields. There'll be integers, a month and a day. And we'll have a constructor that uh, I hope uh, looks is starting to look familiar to you by now, where we have uh, two values and we initialize the fields of this uh, object to those values that are passed into the constructor. Now, remember I said to make objects comparable, their class needs to implement the comparable interface. We might think to write it uh, calendar date implements comparable, but that wouldn't be quite right because the comparable interface is generic. You may have noticed that there is this angle brackets t because the comparable interface says you are comparing to a certain type of object. It may seem a little redundant, but we need to, we need to tell the comparable interface that we're going to compare this object to other calendar dates. And so we say calendar date implements comparable to other calendar dates. And the string class, for example, uh, implements comparable to strings. So implementing this interface isn't the whole story. Uh, the interface says you need to implement a public compare to method that takes something of the, the type you're comparing to uh, and returns an integer. So since we're comparing to calendar dates inside our calendar date class, uh, we have public in compare to uh, take in a calendar date as a parameter. And now we just have to figure out how to actually compare these two dates and return an integer that indicates uh, less than, equal, or greater than. So let's say that we want to compare January 31st and April 5th. Well, we know that January 31st should be less than April 5th, the beginning of the year we're going to say is, is less. And so we don't care so much that uh, the 5th comes before the 31st because the month is, uh, takes precedence in this case and January comes before April. So our first attempt to write compare to looks like this. We say if uh, the month of this object is less than 
the month of the other calendar date we're comparing to, we return negative 1, indicate a less than relationship. If the months are equal, we return 0 to indicate that they're equal, and otherwise we know that our month must be greater than the other month, and we return 1. This is straightforward enough, it's going to compare the months in the right way, but we can actually simplify it somewhat, and we usually want to write simpler code whenever we can. So, we want to return a negative number when the other month is greater, and a positive number when our month is greater, and if they're equal, we want to return 0. And so we can actually simplify this by just subtracting the other month from our month and returning that result. This will have the effect of when the other month is bigger than our month, that will return a negative value indicating that this month is less than that other month. When our month is greater, this will result in, re in returning a positive value, correctly indicating the greater than relationship, and we can still re return zero when appropriate because when the months are equal, this will be zero. So we've managed to simplify our if, else, if, else, by just directly returning the subtraction. And this is a very common pattern uh, when comparing objects in Java. And uh, if you look into how strings are compared, uh, it, it is actually doing something similar. So we're not quite done, because if we were, say, comparing April 1st with April 5th, our current compare to would say that they're equal when we know that they're not, that April 1st becomes before April 5th. Uh, so the day of the month comes into play if the months are equal. So we can extend our compare to to look something like this. If the months are different, we can return the difference of the months like we were doing in the previous version. Otherwise, right, this means that the months are equal. Then we can use the same trick to return the, our, uh, the day of this date minus the day of the other date to return positive, zero, or negative value appropriate to the relationship between these two dates. All right, part two, recursion. So you probably heard the term recursion in CS111, but we're going to encounter it a lot in this course going forward. So I want to take some time to review it here and kind of refresh your memory on what this means. So recursion in a nutshell is something defined in terms of itself. And we also often think in terms of a recursive function, which you may remember is a function that calls itself. So to give a non-computing example, if I'm standing in a long line of people, and I want to figure out what my place in line is. I could use an iterative solution, which is a solution involving a loop, where I count how many people, uh, myself, count how many people are in the line, um, and figure out my place in line that way. But I can also use a recursive solution, which would be to simply ask the person in front of me, hey, what is your place in line? And then that person asks the person in front of them, what is your place in line? And so on and so forth, all the way down to the very first person in line who says, well, hey, I'm, I'm first. Once the person behind them hears that, they're, that the person in front of them is first, they know that they're second. And they can tell the person behind them that who now knows they're third. And then the person who's fourth knows that the person in front of them is third, and so on, all the way back to me, and now I have recursively learned what place I am in line, not by doing all the work myself of counting everyone up as if I was uh, using a loop, but just doing a little bit of work and asking, hey, what place are you in line? And once that person in front of me tells me, I can add one to that and find out my place in line. And this reflects the basic structure of a recursive function, which is we define some base case, some point at which the recursion will stop. And this is typically some, uh, the, the point at which we have no more work left to do. So in the line example, the base case is the person being asked their place in line is the first person in line. And they can just tell, I'm the first person in line. There's no one in front of me. If we're not at the base case, if I'm not the first person in line, I want to make a little bit of progress and make a recursive call. And so that was the part where I asked the person in front of me, what place are you in line? And when that eventually, when the answer eventually came back to me, 
then I could add one to that and know my place in line. We've also seen an example of a recursive data structure, in particular a linked list, in that we can think of a linked list as being consisting of a head node followed by a slightly shorter linked list, which itself is a head node followed by a slightly shorter linked list, and on and on down until our base case of an empty list or a one node list. And we'll see more examples of recursive data structures as we get to trees after the midterm break. But I, I want to kind of review, get us thinking in recursion uh, through an example. So let's say that we want to read in the lines of a file, and the, this file has four lines. This is fun, no. And I want to print those lines in reverse order. So I want to print them out, no, fun is this. And to do this task with a loop, that is to say to do it, to do it iteratively, I would need some sort of data structure for storing the lines in the text and then uh, printing them out in the reverse order. So maybe I read through the file, uh, adding each element to an array list, and then go through the array list in reverse order and print them out that way. But we can actually use recursion to do this without any data structure to store uh, the lines of our list. And going back to the kind of basic structure of recursion, uh, we want to think about cases, a base case, and then what we do uh, otherwise. So let's think, what file would be really easy to reverse? Uh, well, that might be an empty file where there is nothing to reverse. So we might start writing our reverse method, uh, taking a, a scanner that we'll use to read through the lines in the file. We say, if it doesn't have an X line, this is our base case, an empty file, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing to read, so we don't have anything to do. Otherwise, is our recursive case, we're going to work on reversing the lines in the file. Now, the way that we have written this, there's actually nothing to do in this base case, so we might change it slightly to instead say, if there is something to do, then we'll do our recursive case because the else here we don't need to include because we literally want to do nothing in the case of an empty file. So we have, have thought through our base case is an empty file where we will do nothing and then if there is still a line, at least one line to read from our file, we're going to uh, proceed recursively. So as I said, the idea with recursion is to make a little bit of progress and then kind of make a recursive call, hand the rest of the problem off to the recursive call. So our little bit of progress for printing out the lines of the file in reverse would be to read one line of input. So we've kind of, we've read one line of input, we've made the problem a little bit smaller, there's one fewer lines left to read from the file. And if we, uh, in our example, this is fun, no, uh, we've read the first line of the file, it reads this, uh, the, the string this, into our variable line, and we have three lines remaining to be read. And recall that we want to print out these lines in reverse order. No fun is this. So we don't want to print out this yet, and, and we need to find some way to continue going through the lines of the file. So now we need to think about what should we do once we've read one line from our file? Well, the file currently has three lines remaining, and what we want to do is print those lines out in reverse order and then print the line that we just read, uh, which is the string this. And so this is where uh, a, a leap of faith might come in, where we believe that our reverse method does what uh, it's supposed to do, that it reverses, uh, that it prints out the lines of the, uh, from the input in reverse order. And so I might say, we've read our line, then we're going to print out the rest of the lines in reverse order, and once that's done, we're going to print out the line that we're on. So it might not be clear whether this actually works, uh, and I think it's really helpful to kind of go through explicitly all the steps involved in running this function. So I'm going to break it down using this small example file of four lines, and I'm going to do this by kind of visualizing what's called the call stack, which is 
the sequence of function calls that have uh, occurred at any given point in time. And the fact that it's called a stack is no accident. That every time we make a call, we're going to put that new call on top of our stack. And you might visualize this as a stack of papers with the most recent method call on top. So to do this, I'm going to put the code for reverse on such a piece of paper. And note that it includes a spot for our line variable. Uh, and we need to keep track of what this line variable is uh, for any of these given pieces of paper. And so we have our sample input file. This is fun, no. And when we call the method, it reads in the first line, which is going to be this. And then it makes a recursive call on reverse, which, as I said, it means take another piece of paper and put it on top of our call stack as the method that we're currently in. So this is going to put another call to reverse on top of our stack starting at the beginning of reverse. Now it's important to realize that this new call to reverse is independent from the previous one in some important ways. In particular, it has its own uh, local variable line. And so it's going to, again, check if the input has uh, another line. It does. And it will read the next line in the file uh, into its own line variable. And uh, this will read is the second line in our file into the line variable of this method call. And once we do that, we get to this recursive call, which is, again, put a third piece of paper on top of our stack. Here we are, which, again, checks the input, reads the next line, which will read our third line of our file, run, into, again, this method calls version of the line variable. We get to a fourth recursive call, put another uh, piece of paper on our call stack. This checks, is there a next line? There still is. We have our fourth one. We read that in. String line equals input dot next line. So this uh, method calls line variable contains the string no question mark. We get to our uh, recursive call. This brings up a fifth uh, uh, method call to reverse. And you might think of this, these sort of recursive approaches by analogy that, that we can bring an army of however many people we want to help us accomplish some task. And each person is doing a little piece of that task. Where here we can make as many recursive calls to reverse, push, put as many of these uh, methods on the call stack as we need in order to solve our, our problem. Now, in this fifth call to reverse, we check, does the input have a next line? It doesn't. This is false. So we don't do this if we get to the end of our method, and then it returns. And so it never fills in line. It never prints out anything. And when a, and when a method returns, it gets popped off. It gets taken off this call stack, revealing the piece of paper that we had underneath, revealing the previous, uh, the, the next most recent uh, method call. So when we throw away this fifth one, we're left with the fourth one. And the fourth one was making this recursive call to reverse. That's just returned. So we continue from there and print out the line. That prints out no. Then we're done with this method. We discard it. And we're back to our third call to reverse, which again continues from the point where it made the recursive call. right? Its call to reverse has now returned, so it prints out its line variable, which is fun, and then it finishes the, the method and returns. We pop it off our call stack. We now have our second call to reverse. It prints out its line variable, prints out is, and then it returns, and now we're at the original call to reverse at its print where it will print out this. And the three lines that we've printed so far, no got printed first, then fun, then is. And so we see that our leap of faith that uh, the recursive call to reverse would print out the first three, uh, the next, the, the remaining lines in the file in reverse, and then we could print out uh, the string this, that was successful. And we have uh, 
printed out the lines in this file in reverse with these recursive calls, each doing a little bit of work until we hit our base case that did not make a further recursive call. All right, part three, here we go. It's number six on the screen, but it's the third thing I'm talking about, so I'm calling it part three, and this is about merge sort. So merge sort is a, an algorithm to sort some sequence of values, and it's an example of a divide and conquer approach. Uh, it's going to recursively split up the problem into smaller and smaller pieces, solve those, and then combine those solutions uh, into the final solution. These kind of divide and conquer algorithms are uh, fairly common in computer science, and we'll see more examples throughout the course. So why are we talking about merge sort in particular? There are lots of different sorting algorithms. As an aside, uh, my personal favorite is called BOGO sort, which says you have your values, shuffle them up in a random order, and check if they're sorted. If they're not sorted, repeat. I mean, it's terrible in every way, and I love it. But merge sort is actually efficient, unlike this uh, BOGO sort. And it's efficient enough that Java and many other programming libraries use an algorithm based on merge sort for their built-in sorting. And that's actually what the collections.sort that I showed at the beginning uh, uses. So it's a comparison sort, which means it involves comparing objects to put them in the sorted order and thus uses the compare to method uh, that uh, was part one of this lesson. Uh, merge sort is going to provide us with practice thinking about recursion. As, as I said, it's going to recursively split up our problem into smaller pieces. Um, and this isn't specific to merge sort, but computer scientists are generally expected to know about sorting. So uh, I, I definitely wanted to make sure to, to talk about it. So I want to go through merge sort visually on the board first, and then I'll talk through it in terms of a pseudocode of kind of logically how this uh, recursive sort operates. I'm not going to go into the, the Java code because I think the conceptual level is the most important, uh, but there is Java code in the notes uh, if uh, you want to look through that. So let's say we have a sequence of strings, and these strings are cat, Hat, bat, bat, sat, and rat. So merge sort kind of takes place over two phases. There's the phase where we're splitting up the problem into smaller pieces, and then the merge part, where we're going to combine them back together. So let's do the splitting up part first. It's going to recursively divide our problem in half. So we're going to divide. Uh, our list in half and going to be left with our two smaller sublists. We're going to divide these in half, which I'm going to say is our the length divided by two rounded down, and then the rest. So we're going to have one and two uh, for these three element lists. And finally, we need to divide our two element lists in half, or one element uh, lists here are going to be the base case for this recursive uh, division because once we have a one element list uh, we have uh, there's no way to, to split it up into into two parts so we're going to get all the way down to all one element all one element lists and this will happen uh, recursively, as we'll see. And this is the first phase of merge sort. And then we're going to combine uh, all of these uh, sub lists that we've divided our problem up into. We're going to combine them back in such a way that they end up sorted. All right, so here's the sub list that we divided everything down into. And so we'll combine uh, these to first, 
and we want to combine them back into a two uh, element list. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to uh, put our fingers on each of the lists and then between the two elements at my fingers, I'm going to take the one that comes first and put that into the first available spot in the merged list. So that's going to be bat, and then we have nothing left over here, so we just take whatever's here and put it here. And I'll do the same uh, with sat and rat. Again, smaller one at my fingers, first available spot. So we've done that step of the merge. Now we need to merge uh, each of these three back together. And so again, put my finger at the beginning of the, each list, and whichever element my finger is at that comes first goes into the first available spot. So that's bat, and I move my finger to the next spot. Now cat versus hat, cat comes first. And now hat is the only thing that's left, so I put it in here. Merge this side, bat comes, or sorry, rat comes before bat. Sat comes before that, and then that fills in the rest. And now a final merge, where put my finger at the front of each of these, and bat comes first, between bat and rat. Cat is bigger than rat, move this finger over, hat is bigger than rat, move this finger over. And now I've reached the end of one of the two lists I'm merging, and I know that this list is already in sorted order. In fact, at each step of this merge, I have known that the two lists I'm merging are already in sorted order. Maybe they're one element and therefore can't be unsorted, uh, or they're two elements that I know were sorted in a previous merge. So because I know this is sorted, I can just slap it directly into these last three available spots and I don't have to check for whether it's in the right order because I know it was merged into sorted order in a previous step. And so that's kind of visually how our merge sort is going to function. And so let's write up some pseudocode for how this will actually take place. So our merge function is going to say given two sorted lists, which I'm going to call left and right. And an empty list that I'll call that I'll call result. Here's what we'll do. Uh, we'll say while there are elements in both the left and right, uh, in both our, the two lists that we have as input, left and right, we're going to compare Compare the first element in left to the first element in right, and whichever one we find is smaller, we're going to remove that one and append it to result, meaning add it to the end of result. And if we think about this, this while there are elements in both left and right 
compare the first and then remove whichever is smaller and add it to our result. That's that algorithm I was using with my fingers on the board, comparing the element of, at my finger, whichever is smaller, appending it to my result, and then moving my finger over, which is equivalent to removing that smaller element. And so now my finger would be at a new first element uh, in that list. And then Our final step is any elements that are left over, uh, either in left or right, we're going to append them all to the result. And that's like that final step of uh, the merge that I showed where we had brought in all the elements from the left uh, list that I was merging, and we're left with the ones from the right, which we knew were in sort of order, and we could just append them all uh, to our result. So this is the merge step, but we still need to integrate it with uh, the rest of our merge sort algorithm where we break the problem apart into these smaller pieces and then merge them together. So what we'll do is uh, we have our merge routine that I have now erased from the board. And now we're going to think about right, what is our sort routine that will make use of merge to actually produce a sorted, a sorted list. So given that we have some list, we're going to first think about our base case because sort is going to be a recursive function. So we need to think of, all right, at some point we stop recursing uh, and begin merging our, our list back together. And if you remember from the, the visual example, our base case was when we got down to a, uh, a one element list. So uh, we're going to say if our list has more than one element, because if our list has one or zero elements, we don't have any sorting to do. So uh, if it has more than one element, then we're going to uh, need to take some, some action to sort it. And we're going to uh, first divide our list divide our list into left and right uh, as evenly as we can. So basically divide the list, list in half, we have left and right. And then uh, what we want to do is to, we, we know how to merge, um, but merge assumes that, that left and right are sorted. So we'd really like it if we had some way of sorting a list uh, that we could use to sort left and right, except that we do because we're, we have a routine that we're currently writing. It sorts lists. So let's use that. So we're going to sort left and sort right. Oops. And now that left and right are sorted, we can merge them together. And if you remember, merge said given three different things, which were left, right, and a place to put the result, which is the list that we want to sort. And so this is this nice recursive structure that merge sort has where we do some work, we divide our problem in half, left and right. We're going to recursively sort those. And then once we have those two sorted, we're going to use our merge routine to merge them back together into a larger sorted list like we saw merge could do. And this is all that it will take 
to uh, sort our list. Now, we, as we often will, uh, ask what is the uh, efficiency of this merge sort. So uh, our merge here is a linear operation. And we can see that by thinking about, all right, we have our two input lists, left and right. Let's say together, those are the input size n. And our merge routine I went through each element of uh, each list, maybe do a comparison, uh, 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 removing it, adding it to the result. But it kind of did a constant amount of work for each of the, the, the elements in each of these lists. Um, and so it, it's a, a linear time operation because it has to go through every, everything in the list. And uh, how many merges do we have to do is now the key question. Because if merge is big O of n, we now ask, well, how many merges do we have to do? And in our division of our problem into two parts of equal size, we divided uh, our, our initial n in half. We sort each of those. Uh, those again divide in half. And so if we ask how many uh, divisions, how many times can we divide our original list in half until we get to our base case of uh, uh, elements of uh, a list of zero one elements? That is order of log base two of n, because when we want to ask, all right, how many times can we divide n by two uh, until we get to one, that is expressed as log base two of n. And so if we have log base two of n uh, divisions, and for each division, we do one merge of those two halves back together, overall, we get big O of n times log n. And uh, this is uh, fairly efficient as sorting algorithms go. In fact, there is no comparison sorting algorithm that does better than n log n, uh, and which is part of the reason why uh, merge sort is so commonly used is that it's among this class of efficient sorting algorithms. Now we might also think about the space that merge sort takes. And here it's less, uh, less ideal in that this divide the list into left and right, at least how we've been talking about it. This requires that we kind of have two additional lists that have all the elements in the original list. So uh, as I've written it here, merge sort will take some additional space, uh, order n. And when I say order, that's another way of saying big O. So big O of n additional space. Uh, and there are other sorting algorithms that uh, are more efficient on, on that aspect. Last thing that I want to highlight is that there are some links to neat visualizations of different sorting algorithms under different conditions linked from here. Uh, particularly entertaining to me is the YouTube channel Algorithmics, uh, which has uh, a number of different search and sort algorithms uh, done with various classical dances. So I encourage you to check that out. With that, that's all I have to say about sorting in this lesson, and I'll see you next time.